This is Ask Lisa, a podcast to help people understand the psychology of parenting. Psychologist Dr. Lisa Demore, author of two New York Times best-selling parenting books, takes your questions. And I'm co-host Rena Ninen, a journalist and mom of two. Some of what we talk about comes from raising children ourselves. Most of the time, I'll be getting answers to your parenting questions. So send your questions to AskLisa at drlisademore.com. Episode 80, Should I Push My Child Out of the Nest? I feel like I... I feel like you need to give me some steps in how to re-enter society. I know. <laughs> I've been living in my office closet too long here. I know. And it's like such a mixed bag, Rena, right? Because you can you can do so much thanks to digital technology without ever leaving your home. And and I think it's been really weird to try to return to the world. Yeah. I think for I lots mean, of us, yeah. I mean, you always say what an extrovert I am, right? Which is so true. Yes. But I discovered I'm quite happy at home. I'm quite happy with the limited friends that I choose to see. But at what point do I need to like take more action? I, I that's a great question. I think it's I think everyone's asking that right now. You know, what does the next version of my life look like? You know, with this giant pandemic reset between the old life and the new life. And as you say, you know, the way parents react and respond can have tremendous effect on their kids. So we got this letter about independence, when you should learn to let go a little bit more. I want to read this to you. Dear Dr. Damore, I have a question about how my ninth grade daughter should get to school in the morning. We live less than a block away from her best friend and our high school is a little over a mile from our house in Chicago. The girls have the option to bike to school or take public transportation, both of which add an additional 20 minutes to their morning. From the girls' perspective, biking makes them sweaty, it's hard because their backpacks are super heavy, and the bus timing is very unreliable. We were 10 minutes late today, and they were tardy as a result. The truth is, I would be fine driving my daughter to school every day. I felt like it's a small gesture that I can offer that can reduce anxiety and create ease in the start of the school day. The mom of her best friend would rather the girls be on their own, either biking or taking the bus as much as possible. She views this as an important step in resilience and in fostering independence. The other mom and I have compromised somewhat, and the girls now have to get themselves to school three days, and we each drive them one of the other two. What are your thoughts? Is there something wrong with taking my daughter to school every day because I can and because it will simplify her mornings? Or by doing that, am I denying her a chance to be independent? There's so much stress on our daughters, and if there's a small gesture I can make to make it simpler, I'm happy to do that. In gratitude. Oh my goodness, this raises so many questions, especially in this moment, right? It does. It's such a fabulous letter, right? I mean, because it's such a, you know, complex and yet garden variety challenge in parenting. Like, how much do we do for our kids? How much do we go out of our way to make their lives easier? What should we ask of them? What should we give to them? Right? I mean, there's, it's just, it's yeah. such a universally important question for us to ask ourselves yeah. as parents. What's your initial reaction when you heard that letter? Oh, Rena, I had like five. <laughs> but, oh, really? <laughs> but so my, my first initial reaction is that I am hearing everywhere from parents, and it, it wasn't said exactly like this in the letter, but I sort of assume this is also built in. Our kids have been through so much. You know, we have what we have asked of them in the last two plus years was completely bananas. And they have been through incredible distress. They have accommodated themselves to really impossible conditions and managed. And so I think a lot of what I'm hearing from parents is, especially in light of all they've been through, shouldn't we try to smooth their way whenever possible or make their lives easier? Just make their Mm -hmm. lives easier if we can. So that was my first reaction is, you know, I'm hearing this question come up in various ways a lot right now. So are you saying in response to this that this mom, just simplifying the mornings is probably the smartest way to do and find other ways for independence? Nah, I'm not sure I'm saying that. Really? Yeah, and, you know, I'll play my cards face up. I think the kids should get themselves to school. 
Like, I think it's a pretty ideal situation, right? You have, you know, a best friend a block away, you have bikes, you have a bus, you also have two feet, (laughs) you know, if the parent (laughs) is inclined. And, you know, just over a mile walk will take ninth graders with heavy backpacks about a half an hour, you know, because they don't tend to truck it. Um, I would also put a vote in for that. And, you know, it's um, a lot of healthy exercise. I know how heavy the backpacks are. I've got two yeah, kids with backpacks. You've seen these right. backpacks, right? I mean, it's yeah. like, what the heck, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and yet it gives them total control, total autonomy, total freedom. They're controlling the timing. They won't get as sweaty. So I would even argue for the longer route, you know, adding maybe 30 minutes to the morning, uh-huh. I think there's a lot to be said for it. And and we can unpack all that's to be said for saying, you know what, kiddo, get yourself to school. That's my initial reaction. But it still gets us into the heart of this question of what about when we do favors for our kids? And how much should we protect them from distress under normal conditions and especially now? So when is it too much? Like you're just overextending yourself and the kid really... You're enabling the kid, essentially. Yeah, yeah. You know, really kind of um, providing concierge service that, yeah. you know, may be beyond what's ex- really helpful to them. I don't know that there's any magical line. But I I think one way we could size this up is, am I asking a child to do something that is within their capacities? Maybe not comfortable, but within their capacities. Mm-hmm. And is it something that helps them develop a skill set that they're going to need? You know, maybe that's sort of how it gets sized up. Mm -hmm. And the skill set here is like you need to learn to get yourself together and out the door in the morning. Yeah. You're in ninth grade. And manage the timing and, um, you know, be in charge of this. And it's so lovely, like, the you know, that this parent and the other parent negotiated, you know, three days. They get themselves one day each. They drive. I think that's a good compromise for now. When I hear that, and I don't know if this was your reaction, I'm like, eh, routines are better. Like, it's actually easier on everyone if every day looks the same and it's not, oh, okay, it's Wednesday, so who's driving? It's Tuesday, so who's, you know, biking? I, I think on the routine piece alone, I'd say, no, 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 the, the default is you're getting yourself yeah. to school. You can bike, you can yeah. walk, but you'll figure it out. And there's also something nice of having to coordinate with another person and then if they're running late, maybe they hop on their bikes. You know, I mean, that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there's a lot of um, organizing that a ninth grader can and should be able to do to get themselves to school on time. And what's amazing, they have three good options in this situation that do not involve a parent driving them. Mm. You know, my initial reaction was, oh, yeah, of course, drive them to school. Who wants to be sweaty? It's hard to get up in the morning. I'm a total enabler is what I'm <laughs> discovering today. No. We love our kids. And, Rena, I think one of the pieces that gets lost in the conversation about helping kids become increasingly independent and pushing them to do things, one of the things I think that gets lost is what a pleasure it is as a parent to dote on your kids and Mm -hmm. also do nice things for your kids. Like, it's a really, like under-celebrated thing. Like, I love making breakfast in the morning. And my kids can make breakfast. Like, they can do it, but it's, I don't want them to. Like, I want to say, okay, what do you want? You know, and I love doing it. And so I don't in any way want to minimize that there are real pleasures in doing for children things that they can do for themselves. Wait a minute. Dr. Lisa makes breakfast for her girls every morning? <laughs> uh, a what? lot of toaster waffles. A lot of toaster <laughs> waffles. Like, no. Oh, Not that fancy. Except for my older daughter, we have a code. It's her super breakfast, um, where oh. we do an avocado toast with egg. You know, so Ooh. yeah, it sounds good. I it is good right actually, now. and it, and it you know fuels her up for the day. But I, I I am not of the mind that you know as soon as a kid is capable of something, you hand it over and you yeah you know you don't do it anymore because like the parent misses out in that yeah. And it's ninth grade. Come on, you know the 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 years are dwindling, right? It kind of hurts your heart. So I can understand that. So what do you say? Um, So I'm going to pause. We're going to take a quick break. But on the other side of this, I want to ask you sort of about this pandemic and how difficult it's been on kids. How can we make their lives easier and what your advice is as we're hopefully trying to emerge out of this? We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Ask Lisa podcast. We're talking about how much independence you should give your kids and when you should sort of push them out of the nest to do a little bit more. 
So part of this conversation, we're asking um, just kind of curiously about the fact that kids have been through so much with this pandemic. Should we be making their lives easier? This is like the million dollar question, right? How much distress should we help kids learn to tolerate, right? I mean, this is like the key question. I think in development, it's one of the most key questions. And I think now it's so much more complicated because they've been through so much. So there's two things I want us to focus on here. One is the kids who can tolerate more distress, more discomfort, sweaty backpacks, long walks, <laughs> end up with more freedom. What do you mean? So think about a young person who isn't really used to walking places. And mm. I mean, maybe I mean, this sounds weird, but like maybe doesn't even have a whole lot of muscular strength from carrying heavy backpacks places. It doesn't build up that capacity. So then if a cool option becomes available, that the way they can get themselves there is they have to walk, you know, they have to truck there and they have to carry heavy things. That's suddenly less available to them because it's unfamiliar. It's not as known. They haven't been doing it every day in a, in a kind of, you know, regular way. And so they may be inclined to hold back on things or do fewer things. Or, you know, you think about, Rena, scary things you did when you were younger. Not mm -hmm. dangerous, but scary things. Like, um, I think a little bit about some like hiking and rock climbing I did growing up in Denver you know, or, you know, being out on one's own. And there is that sense of like, this is a lot, this is at an edge for me. And then having done that, you feel braver to do other things. And it, it creates freedom to discover that you can tolerate discomfort. Wow. And another way to frame it, Rena, is there's no guarantee anything's going to be comfortable, especially anything unfamiliar. And so if a young person feels like, I can only do it if I know I'm going to be comfortable. They're not going to be able to do a lot of things. Mm. But if they, we can set it up that, well, you can do it. And if you get uncomfortable, you've been there before, you can handle discomfort. They can do a lot of things. So that's one way we want to walk into this. You know, this concept of letting them lean into the distress here, it's like every parent wants to protect their, it's like instinctive, right? You don't want them to go through distress. What are cases of like instances of distress where you think, feel it's actually good, like let them lean into this and feel that because it'll make them stronger on the other end. Honestly, Rena, I, I know this is going to seem extreme. I would say anything that's safe. I mean, of course, safety is always the limit. Like if it's unsafe, it's not, it's a non-negotiable, shouldn't happen. But we really want kids to discover that doing things that are you know, require a lot of bravery, yeah. doing things that require a lot of tolerance of uncertainty, um, you know, doing those things. We want them to discover that they can do those things, that feeling scared, that feeling uncertain doesn't harm them, you know, that they get through the feeling, that they can tolerate the feeling. And then usually the things that require bravery or a tolerance of uncertainty have all these bonuses, right? Like now this kid is walking with their friend. They have a half an hour every morning to stretch their legs, be out in the air, talk mm -hmm. to each other. You know, there's good stuff that happens in that context. You know, I think we focus on the negatives, mm -hmm. the child who's nervous in front of us, but we can forget, well, being brave means you're doing things that have potential to also be amazing. And so I would say so long as it's safe, I would push into that space. But the other little twist in all of this, Rena, that I think, you know, so if one thing that is going to be driving this is we want kids to have freedom. Another thing that's actually pulling back on this is guilt, right? We feel guilty about what kids have been through, or at least bad for them about what yeah. they've been through. And what it makes me think about, Rena, is the nearest corollary I can think from my clinical work is when parents have been through a divorce and, it, you know, divorces are hard on kids. And so they feel guilty about what the kid went through, whether or not they were the one who somehow felt responsible for the divorce. And that that shapes forward parenting, that what the kid went through through the divorce, they're like, well, but they've been through so much. And I can tell you, Rena, it, it never works well. Guilt-informed parenting tends not to be our parenting A-game. We indulge kids in ways that aren't necessary. We make compromises that aren't necessary. We don't ask enough of them. So if guilt is driving this train, I would 
be very cautious about that. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's interesting. And I sort of feel at this moment, I mean, I know you can't walk us through necessarily each age group, but how do we know, especially with the summer approaching, and we're all thinking of how to keep our kids occupied and what to do this summer, how do we know developmentally what we should be doing with our kid or, or when we should allow? Like, obviously, you're not going to let a three-year-old walk into town, right? And, <laughs> and, right. But, you know, if you've got kids on the verge of middle school or in high school or leaving for college, you know, these are sort of crucial years where they do want some more independence. What's your advice for parents creating a roadmap on what they should be doing? You know, it's funny. Do you have like a mommy mentor? I have a mommy mentor. You I have do? a couple. Tell me yeah. more. No, tell me more. I have a couple of women who are 10 years my senior, who oh, I yeah. think are fabulous and wonderful and brilliant mm. and really good parents, like really good parents whose gut I trust. And sometimes I will go to them when I have a question about what, you know, how to get through a hard thing or what to reasonably expect. Because they've done it before, and they've done it with a couple kids and a couple different kinds of kids. And I can trust their view on what I can fairly ask of my child. And Mm -hmm. one of the huge benefits is they did it all before the pandemic, because the pandemic has really shifted our understanding of what kids can do, because they've just been so close to home for so long. Yeah. So one way I think to do it is to do a little data collection. Like, what are other parents in your community Mm -hmm. asking of their kids? You know, and what do you, you know, because there's a lot of stuff going on around us. And we know the other parents in our community. And who do we think, you know, we really love how they think? Who do we think, no, that's not really my cup of tea. But I would also really encourage people to seek for very specific questions advice from people who've been there before and especially been there before, but not in the pandemic. Mm. That's such a great idea, you know, finding somebody. And, and, and now that you mention it, like there are people I look up to who have kids that are 10 years older that you see how they've sort of let go a little bit. And and what what I what resonates with me is the independence now that you mention it, that they've given their kids instead of sort of, you know, smothering them, given them a longer leash or, you know, a little bit more freedom to go do things. And um, I see the incredible human beings they've become. Well, that's right, right? You get to be get both the advice and see the outcome, right? Yeah. You can see, you know, you can see the, the finished product and you're like, I love the way your kid came out. When you had to decide about this, how, <laughs> how would you have made that call? I think that's one way to do it. The other thing in here, Rena, to get back to the piece around kids being so close to home over mm-hmm. the last few years, we are talking a lot, we've been talking a lot in the culture about what kids missed, you know, the developmental milestones kids missed, things that didn't happen that would have happened. And what I haven't heard discussion of that I think we want to name is that parents missed those milestones too. Oh, wow. I never thought of it that way. What right? Mean? I mean, like, the first time you send your kid to, like, walk over to the grocery store and get something, you know, you can do this with a lot of 7th and 8th graders, depending on, you know, the configuration of your community. But no one was doing that with their 7th and 8th graders. Mm. And so in many ways, I think for parents, letting our kids be increasingly independent, it's about kind of getting broken in. <laughs> like You have to just do it <laughs> step by step. And none of us had to break in. They've been under our noses. They were away at college and came home right, mm-hmm. and lived with us. Mm-hmm. And so I'll tell you, Rena, where I felt this so deeply in my own life. So, you know, I have this daughter who's a senior in high school. So the pandemic hit end of her sophomore year and she has great friends, but they're not particularly social. Like they don't go to parties and they weren't going to a lot of parties as 10th graders. And, you know, it was like three weeks ago she had gone out to a party and we'd said, come home when, you know, come home when you come home. Like we're not going to give you a curfew. You know, she's 18 and it Mm -hmm. just felt like I can trust her. So here I am kind of waking up through the night. It's 11. Is she home? I don't feel like she's home. You know that you can you can sense their energy mm-hmm. in the house. It's midnight. Mm-hmm. Is she home? And and eventually she got home. But I thought, all right, this is amazing. I have done this once in parenting a teenager. Wow. And now I'm sending this child off to college. And oh, my gosh. It's such a leap, Rena, to <sighs> like – all of that breaking in of having a teenager who's out and about and you just come to tolerate it and then you send them to college and you can better tolerate that because you've been broken in, the parents, myself included, 
we miss those milestones. And so we're being asked to make these giant leaps of like, send them to college, even though one time in high school, you waited up for them. (laughs) Yeah, right. So I feel for parents in this. And that's maybe why it's also helpful to talk to parents who hit these milestones pre-pandemic, because they can help us recalibrate to what we can reasonably expect. Wow. I never thought about it as parents missing the milestones. I've always looked at it and felt bad for the kids who have missed these milestones. Yeah, we grow alongside them. And usually, Rena, they're pushing our growth. You know, they're the ones saying, I want to go over to the sleepover at this kid's house. And we're like, eh, I'm not so crazy about that kid's family. And they're like, come on, come on, come on. And then we give in. And then we see that the world doesn't end. And then we can tolerate more independence on their part. You know, this is a, a, you know, a kind of a hand in hand process, often driven by the teenager that all got blown up over the last few years. And so now we're not sure what to provide and what to say no to. And I I have a lot of like tenderness for how confusing this moment is for parents. Mm -hmm. I know we can't tell exactly now, it's still too early, but these milestones that have missed, how do you think it's going to affect parents and, you know, kids down the road. You know, you talk about this group of um, kids going to college now that didn't have these experiences that help you develop in high school. I think it's going to be all over the map, Rena. You know, I think there's a lot of stuff kids missed in high school that it's perfectly fine that they missed, you know, the raging party in somebody's basement. <laughs> you know, there's no, no <laughs> harm done there. And they yeah. never needed it. And they're all the better for it. And I think there are kids who feel may feel more shy and cautious than they otherwise would. And then, of course, as a parent, if your kid's feeling shy and cautious, your anxiety goes up, so then you can feel like you want to keep them closer to home. Um, And I think there are some kids who really have become very, very anxious in the pandemic and whose lives have become very narrow. And, And so then it just, it doubles down the work for the parents because we want them to return to a normal developmental trajectory And they've been knocked off course, and everyone they know has been knocked off course. And what I would say is, we should push for correction. I don't think we want to try to overcorrect, you know, to say, like, call me when you get work. But I think there's a lot to be said for trying to remember what we were able to do at those ages, trying to look around to see, you know, that's a really competent kid, and she's doing this, so I think you can do it. I mean, I think we don't our gut is not that good right now because we missed out on the things that would help us develop our capacity to push kids and to tolerate their independence. Mm, That's really good. So just to wrap it up, what's the yardstick? When should we be pushing our kids? When should we be offering support? I think you should default on the pushing a little bit. If you're not sure, so if you think it's in their capacity, I, you know, I, I don't think I'm asking anything unfair. Default on the pushing. And if you're uncomfortable about this, think, well, what's the worst case scenario, right? Say yeah. I ask her to walk to school and she's like, what? And you're like, I think you can do it. You got to leave in enough time. And she ends up having to trot the last block and she's upset about it. Okay, if that's the worst case scenario, data have been collected. You'll look mm-hmm. at it tomorrow. You can reevaluate. I don't think that we push kids only when we know it's going to go well. I think we push kids when we know it's safe, but I don't think that the measure should be, and it's going to go great. Like, I, a lot gets learned in the hiccups of things. Yeah. But the other thing that is wonderful in this is if we push them most of the time or more of the time, then we also in some ways, I think, amplify the gift of the times when we go out of our way to make their lives easier. So I'll Mm. I'll give you an example um, where we are, nobody clears their sidewalks when there's snow. And so then they get really, really icy. And sometimes Mm -hmm. they can, the ice can last for a long time. And it's my worst, my, I hate that part of the winter. Yeah. Yeah. And my older daughter walks to school. And when the sidewalks are like this, you can't walk on them. And so then you're walking in the street Yes. And then, of course, the street is narrowed by all the sludge and, you know, piled up snow. And it's miserable. And there were a few days this winter where I was like, you know what? I'm driving you. Like, that. this is ridiculous. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want you walking on the street. And it's, you know, 10 degrees out. I'm going to drive you. Mm-hmm. 
And so, you know, like, you know, of course, there I am. I'm driving her in my pajamas, right, with my running <laughs> shoes on, and, like, my pajamas, one and like would. a parka <laughs> over that. But then she's like, "Ah, oh, that's wonderful." And it, it's, you know, it's a little inconvenience for me. It's a huge boost for her. And so I think it, it doesn't have to be hard and fast. And we can save our, you know, extra going the extra mile for our kids. We can save it for when it's going to make a really material difference in their day to day or that that particular day, as opposed to offering it as a in a generic convenience. Mm, that's interesting. So not being the crutch, but when they need it, also knowing it's time to step up and helping them. Absolutely. Mm. So, Lisa, what do you have for us for parenting to go? You know, this this letter and this conversation reminds me of something I learned in my training when I was taking care of a 20-year-old woman who was asking me to write letters for all sorts of accommodations for her at work because of um, her psychological diagnosis. And I could do it, but I, I didn't quite feel right. And I took it to my supervisor. I was in training. And my supervisor said, I want you to go back to your client and I want you to say to her, we can do this, but it means that we're treating you as more fragile than I think you are. Mm. And I did. And we had that conversation. And it was a really fruitful conversation because I didn't say no, but I put the question of her fragility on the table. And I also put my confidence that she wasn't as fragile as she felt on the table. And it let us really deepen the work. So I want to put that out there, that there's helping our kids and, you know, taking them when it's icy, and there's treating them as more fragile than they are. And we want to make sure that we're um, watching which one we're doing. I've opened my eyes to things that I realize I've been doing that uh, I now understand Maybe I need to step back a little. <laughs> it's so hard, Rena. It's so it hard. It is, especially with this pandemic. Um, yeah. But it's, I'm grateful that we're having these conversations and you've made us aware and um, that we're in this new phase, too. Very grateful. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Lisa. And next week, we're going to talk about how do you deal when your kids are just so mean to you. I'll see you next week, Lisa. I'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Ask Lisa podcast so you get the episodes just as soon as they drop. And send us your questions to asklisa at drlisademore.com. And now a word from our lawyers. The advice provided on this podcast does not constitute or serve as a substitute for professional psychological treatment, therapy, or other types of professional advice or intervention. If you have concerns about your child's well-being, consult a physician or mental health professional. If you're looking for additional resources, check out Lisa's website at drlisademore.com. We'll see you next week.